Thank you, Barry. Um, and I echo uh, Barry's uh, thanks to Catapult for uh, sponsoring this symposium and inviting me to Prague. I've never been to Prague. It's, a, it's supposed to be a, a fantastic city, so I'm looking forward to spending a little bit of time here over the next 24 hours. Uh, my intention for the next 20 or 30 minutes or so is to um, engage a little bit in the uh, application of return to training and return to play programs. Um, as Barry said, there's not a huge amount of literature out there, but um, hopefully I can share a little bit of my experience um, over the last 15 or 17 years or so in, in football and in specifically working with uh, injured, injured athletes. I think it's, uh, it's fairly well known, um, particularly in the big leagues across Europe, uh, that the cost of injuries is, is escalating. Um, and if you look at some of this, some of this data, uh, maybe these, these figures here may be slightly speculative, and of course, it's difficult to put some numbers and finances exactly on um, what injuries cost. But all we can say is that they're spiraling, and therefore the, the demands placed on ourselves as sports scientists and our medical colleagues um, is getting greater year on year. Of course, the sports science role uh, in the rehabilitation process of professional footballers has changed over time and has evolved. Um, I think with the quantification of data, particularly from a load management point of view for our athletes, we're able to add a layer of objectiveness to what maybe historically has been carried out through instinct, experience and intuition. Of course, that still has a a very valid place in the rehabilitation of athletes and, and Barry mentioned the psychological aspects which I'll touch on in a little while and I think it's important that um, we acknowledge that aspect that intuition and experience and getting to know the athlete is an important factor of return to play protocols. However, as our research uh, improves and our knowledge becomes greater, our application in sports science perspective becomes more valuable. In the design of uh, rehabilitation and return to play protocols, it's important to acknowledge uh, different elements. By setting principles, it sets out scenes within a unique environment. And by setting a scene in a unique environment, I mean that the, the club or the organization that we're working with is pretty unique in often the way it's run. Certainly our athlete is unique. Their healing properties are unique. So by putting some principles to the way that we program and design our program allows us to set the scene for our planning and application. Of course, the evidence supports what we do, but it doesn't always translate in every situation. And we have to be mindful of that and then to build in some flexibility within our programs. Of course, from a planning perspective, it's a multidisciplinary uh, process. Um, so it's not just us delivering something on the field or on the grass to a football player. Of course, it's a long-term process, particularly with our long-term injuries. So our colleagues within the medical profession, consultants, medics, physiotherapists, sports therapists, sports nutrition, sports psychology, etc., and of course, big stakeholders, the coaching and management team, and the players themselves uh, should be brought into that decision-making process. Our application of our plan should be fairly rigid and fairly structured, but at the same time allow some adaptability and flexibility in the program, particularly from a late-stage perspective. If we're taking a football player into a late stage of rehabilitation, we're exposing them by nature to increased volumes, increased intensity than what they've been used to maybe over the last months. So as a consequence, we may well have to regress a program that we thought in the early stages may be appropriate. So flexibility is important. Evaluating the process provides us with a picture of progression. And it's an important aspect of allowing us to learn about our athlete, whether that's imaging, whether that's consultative appointment of uh, assessment, sorry, or, or whether that's um, us providing objective and subjective data. 
I remember working with an athlete in 2008. Um, he was injured playing for his national team. He uh, suffered an ankle injury which required surgery. Um, he had the surgery, he's in, in a cast, in a boot, post-surgery. So I went every afternoon, I went to his apartment to collect him, to take him down to the rehabilitation center so that we could work together. And effectively, over that six-month period, I spent more time with him and his family than I did my own. Um, so I got to know him very well. Um, and then I realized during that period that one of the most important stakeholders are the athlete and their families. And actually, his wife was instrumental in helping us help him to recover. So it was a, an, an important area of our, of our future planning. When we're talking about long-term uh, rehabilitation strategies, there are a number of areas that we should acknowledge. Injury history, of course, age of the athlete, re-injury rates, and whether the injury itself is a repetitive injury or a current injury, um, or whether it's a new injury, will all have a, a bearing on how we design our programs. The restoration of a sport-specific function will be twofold. Some of that function will be restored in a gymnasium setting maybe, in the basic movement patterns, and some will be restored on the field, more in a sport-specific nature. When we look at skill and the restoration of skill, it's specific to the sport, specific to the athlete, and specific probably to the position they play within the team. Restoration or really maintenance of the aerobic capacity or the aerobic abilities in football, of course, is a, an important aspect. So restoring that fitness level is in another part of the context of which we're working. And then finally, the psychosocial readiness of our athletes should be considered. Often our athletes are uh, injured if they're a long-term injury. They're often neglected, but they, they can't affect a match. Uh, sometimes uh, the head coach or the manager may well not see them for a while because they're, they're not with them on a Saturday afternoon or whatever, whenever you play. Um, so as a consequence, they can lose confidence, become anxious maybe, particularly if their injury is a repetitive injury, and towards the end stage of their rehabilitation before they return to training, often they can become quite anxious. So the sports psychologist comes into their own sometimes towards that end part and working with the athletes through that process, enabling them to be confident in going back into training. Our baseline measures, if you look at the top, um, are created over time. And it's not just something that we test in pre-season training or when the athlete is fit. Our baseline is our knowledge of our, our holistic knowledge of our player. And that can come from history, if the player's been with us for a while, uh, maybe injury history, um, what they did at other clubs. Um, so I think the baseline is our under understanding and overall profile of our, of our athlete. But once an injury occurs, then we need to assess the data um, and to understand what data is most meaningful and useful or impactful within our program. If we look at match exposure here, um, understanding what our player is needing or going into once they return to training, once they return to play, provides us with some context for our progressions. So we're quite clear, we know where they were at the starting point because they're injured, but we need to know where, they, where the end point is or the goal is in order for us to progress with context. So as sports scientists now, we need to understand a little bit more than just the physiological process of recovery from injury. We need to establish what our playing style may be, or our tactical formations, or the formation that, or the demands that are placed on the player uh, is within the, within the context of the way we play. Integrating tactical and technical elements into our process um, is something that we should consider. And particularly from a late stage, and I'll touch on it a little bit later in the presentation, uh, talking about integration of our coaches potentially 
into the rehabilitation process. And certainly we need to individualise our programmes. Uh, even uh, in my experience, even working with uh, two on the surface, same players, same positions, the players play in very different ways. So I think that's important to, to acknowledge the individualisation of our programmes. And this just gives you an example of something we worked on in 2016. So if you look at the uh, parameters here, and you could use any parameter, but this is the raw data from a match situation. This was a central defender in this particular case. Um, this is the raw match data, and this is their rolling average uh, over the course of the season. Um, prior to 2016, we weren't allowed to wear um, any kind of uh, live data or monitoring systems in, in competitive games, so we were reliant really on pre-season matches, but since then we've been allowed to wear them. Um, so this is some of the data, and it gives us twofold really. Uh, the first point is allowing us to understand exactly what that player um, is needing in terms of the, the parameters that are expected of them or the demands that are placed on them within the system we play. And also from an individual recovery point of view, we're able to use the match-to-match -match data, uh, data to individual, uh, individualize their uh, recoveries. So also it's important for us to understand the environment in which we're working. Of course it's a multifactorial environment, interdisciplinary, and it's very unique to the situation or the club or the organisation that we're working with. Our resources, uh, location, the climate, travel, commercial demands, etc., uh, management demands, are all specific to our environment. Integrating coaching philosophy within our programme and the physical, requ physical requirements of that that are placed on the players is also uh, helping us understand the environment in which we work. My question to you would be, if you're in an organisation like that, or you work in a club, where you're working with football players, is that something that you're considering in terms of their, their return to play protocols? Of course, it doesn't work everywhere. Integrating coaching, I understand, doesn't always work, and I'm kind of put, um, painting a rosy picture. Um, but I think if we can integrate our coaching processes into the rehabilitation process, um, then it will certainly, certainly help us. Now, whichever model you use, whether you use acute chronic work ratio, the fact remains or not, the fact remains that players will generally go from a state of um, relative uh, uh, underwork, if you like, to um, working uh, volume and intensity will increase over time. So it's important for us to manage that load and manage that uh, over, the, over the course of the rehabilitation period. Now, whichever model we use, um, it's important for us to do that. So I'll show you some examples of that in a second. So I've shown you this graph here. Um, so this is at Blackburn Rovers um, in 2016-17. And I've got to credit Rob Hayworth, who actually uh, was at Blackburn Rovers at the time working with me. Uh, he's now working for Catapult, actually. Uh, Rob... Uh, drew up these algorithms here. Um, what we wanted to do is to work um, in a language which suited everybody. Because obviously we understand this and we understand the demands and how we break this down from a scientific point of view and potentially a medical point of view. But not everybody does. Maybe when you're talking to a player or a coach, they don't necessarily understand all this. So what we wanted to do is bring all this data down into one single number which is representative of that session. Um, so, you can see the blues here, they represent the volume of the session, the yellows, the extensity, we're not quite sure that's still a word, but extensity of the session, and then these four green bars here represent the intensity of the session, so change of direction, jumps, accelerations and decelerations, etc. And then the red part here is the cardiac load, and then it's summarised in these bars here, and then we brought it down to a number, so Rob kind of is much brighter than me, so I couldn't explain to you why this, how that algorithm is, is, um, is worked. However, we, we use this number to represent um, a training session relative to a match. So 10 being a match, 5.6 theoretically therefore is 56% of a match. So that represents 56% of a match. Now we were able to use this across 
all the clubs. So everybody, whether it's performance analysis, um, medical professionals, coaches and players, we always, we always use the same, uh, the same number. So when I look at delivery, um, there are, of course, different stages of late-stage rehabilitation. Um, and these are preceded with, there's nine um, preceding stages here. And they're general functional stages or restoration of function, maybe in the gym-based stages. So these, are, these particular stages here, 10 to 17, represent the grass or field-based um, progressions. And for the purposes of today, I'll concentrate on 12 to 14. So these are the grass-based progressions here. Um, I'm not sure you can see this, um, but this is uh, some introduction into some technical elements of rehabilitation. Um, but the main technical and tactical and physical development is done in these uh, three phases here. So if you look at uh, stage 12, um, the representation here, I'll just go back one actually, sorry. Stage 12. Um, you'll see the representation here is of some technical, basic technical skill, reintroduction. So it's very basic. And the key to this part of the stage is to reduce the amount of speed or actually control the amount of speed, either through live monitoring or post-session. Um, so pretty subjectively, we're saying to the player, look, you can do all these movements, but make sure you do it within this restricted speed threshold. Okay, so this is the... Uh, this is the, the session, if you like. And what we did with each stage is broke it down into three sub-stages. So stage 12A is based on extensity, so we're looking at longer distances. Um, stage 12B would be more intense, so shorter distances, probably more changes of direction. And then stage 12C would be a combination of the two. So you can see there's nine, potentially nine stages over the three uh, individual 12, 13, and 14. The energy system development within this stage is more focused around aerobic endurance and aerobic power. If we move on to uh, stage 13, the emphasis shifts a little bit more into more tactical um, elements here. So, uh, sorry, technical elements here. And in this stage, this is where the coach is potentially get involved in helping us with the return to play. So the speed threshold has increased up to 75%. Um, the technical demand of the session is increased. As I say, that's where we can get the coaches. So potentially we might put this player in the position on the pitch that they play. And so we represent the demands of that position. So in this particular case, if this player is passing a football over 20 yards, what does that look like if they're a central defender? What does that look like if they play in central midfield? The energy system development within this stage has gone up to aerobic power and anaerobic endurance. Stage 14 then is um, up into kind of maximal areas. So we're looking at maximally challenging the players. Um, and so we're certainly involving the coaches at this stage on tactical and technical elements. Physiologically, we're driving their energy system up to anaerobic power. They're working maximally. Um, so also, of course, at this stage, we're bringing in the psychological elements of can they do what they did before they became injured. Um, so they get, they get this regain of confidence from having done that. And that then moves on to stages 15 to 17, which are very much injury-specific. Um, so these are, these are tests that will test the individual, whatever the individual injury is, um, and we'll put them through that, a battery of tests designed specifically for these injury types. We'll also want to um, uh, put them through the potential mechanism of injury um, so that they're getting confidence that actually their joint or their muscle, or whatever it was, is strong enough to cope with that original demand um, based on uh, the, the mechanism originally. This is goes, gives you an overview of the energy systems here. Um, some of the, the extensive work that we would have done in stage A, the intensive, intensive in stage 
be and the relevant stage that, they, that we work in from aerobic endurance up to anaerobic power. Now, historically, in the testing here would have been done in pre-season, so we'd have some normative data um, for that player. So we'll be looking for them to achieve around these test results in each of these stages from an energy system development perspective. So some of the key points um, around the delivery are the replication of variables and intensities to train at, at an intensity, sorry, relevant to match play. Maintain focus on the gradual increase in load to avoid excessive overload and the potential for secondary injury. We need to create a buy-in from our players by publishing the program in advance, get to know them, and use a language which is appropriate to them. Include some flexibility in the program and remain adaptable, particularly from a late stage perspective. Last few slides. I just wanted to show you this slide because you've, you've seen this data already. Um, and this is how it's represented. And towards the end stage of rehabilitation, uh, we wanted to see where our individual players were in relation to the squad training. So these bars represent still volume, still extensity, still intensity, and the red ones doing still cardiac load. But this is our individual for that particular week versus what the squad average was. And that's not a positional average. That's a squad average, but it still gives us a representation of where the rehabilitation of the player was in relation to our squad or our team. And finally, this graph was just a, uh, a chronic, uh, sorry, a, chronologic, a chronological um, representation of the, the extensity, intensity, etc. And just we use a acute chronic work ratio at the time. Um, just looking at making sure that our loading wasn't overloaded week on week. Um, this is towards the end stage of rehabilitation where the player actually returned to competitive action there. So finally, just to summarise um, some of the points from the presentation, I think we need to provide context to our rehabilitation programmes uh, by individualising the expectations and the demands placed on our players relative to their match positions and the way we play. We need to create a clear understanding of the player and the team's needs, maintain a robust multidisciplinary approach. And when I talk about the, the reporting process, it's not just ourselves as sports scientists working with our medics. This is across a multitude of platforms. So getting a language which you all understand is important integrating our coaching philosophy into our rehab program is important if appropriate at certain times. And developing a transparent evaluation process that is meaningful to all stakeholders. And finally, using appropriate language within the context of what we're doing. Thank you. <laughs>